So with all the fancy introductions out of the way, welcome back to the podcast, Matt Reynolds and Anne-Marie Mohan. Matt, welcome. Thanks for having me. Anne-Marie, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure's always mine. Today we're here to talk about bioplastics. And bioplastics, first of all, as I say it out loud, sounds like a, what, an oxymoron? Oxymoron, bioplastic. Anyway, they were going to be this silver bullet that was going to solve every problem. Um, they were going to be the film. They were going to be the resin. They were going to be the things that we were going to use that was going to be renewable. And everybody was excited about it, whether it was 10, 15 years ago. And I feel like everyone started throwing their R&D budgets and things at it. So I guess to start, before we really get into it, why was that the case? Well, one thing that really captured uh, everyone's attention about bioplastics is that they're made from a renewable resource versus being made from petroleum. So they use sugarcane, they use corn, and now they're even using more cellulose uh, feedstock like uh, wood chips and things like that. Oh, so really? it's okay. made from a renewable resource. Um, and not only are they uh, a renewable resource, but because they are, they sequester carbon. So they take carbon in rather than emitting it. So that's another advantage. And um, as we moved along in the development of bioplastics, uh, there came a technology called drop-in plastics or bioplastics, where they have the same functionality and same properties as a petroleum-based plastic. So with the early uh, PLA or poly polylactic acid, mm -hmm. which was the biggest thing to happen right. like back in 2000 or so. Uh, the problem was that you could make the bottle. Uh, it didn't have the same properties. It was really sensitive to heat. And then it also would contaminate the recycling stream. But for a consumer, you couldn't really tell the difference in right. the bottle. So they'd just throw it in with recycling. But with drop-in bioplastics, you have the same functionality. Uh, they can be recycled. And so that was a huge advancement in the technology. Interesting. So the, the good plastics would contaminate the bad plastics, essentially? Bad being my term for in the recycling chain, but this stuff from natural resources, I guess, because it's not the same. Interesting. I wouldn't have thought of it that way. I guess I just figured it would fizzle out once it got into the uh, recycling chain. Yeah, fun functionally, it's the same, but you know, it, as soon as it gets to, to the MRF, then that's where trouble occurs. Right. The MRF, there's a lot of trouble at the MRF, and I, we've understood that as we've done a series of these podcasts. All right, so this stuff is awesome. Why isn't it everywhere? Why are we not seeing it on every shelf? Why isn't it? Well, I mean, one thing that's changed since you mentioned 2000 to the early 2000s is, um, you know, plastics in general have just really taken a perception beating. You mm -hmm. know? Um, so the focus on sustainability as it pertains to packaging is now you know, the, the eye is cast on plastics right. and bioplastics are still plastics. They're still, oh, okay. they're still, they're still a, a kind of an alphabet soup of P E P E T and all these kinds of, uh, you know, letters, uh, that confuse consumers and, uh, and scare consumers because they're not exactly sure how to recycle it. And as Anne-Marie said, some of them can't be recycled. I, I think early on there was this misconception that, uh, you know, because the bios in the word, they assume they're biodegradable. Right. So over the years, we had to be real careful about defining what biodegradable is just because it's bioplastic doesn't make it biodegradable necessarily. And the differences between compostability and backyard versus, you know, industrial compostability and biodegradability, these are all very kind of it's Venn diagrams that overlap a little bit, but, mm -hmm. you know, they're not the same thing. Right. So it's further confusing to the consumer. It, it costs more. Bioplastics cost more. I mean, that's a you know always, bottom line kind of thing. Always the driver. So, yes. Yeah. So petroleum-based virgin plastic is really high quality and it's super cheap the way it's it's made right now. And there's a lot of efforts right now to kind of level that playing field and, and create some, you know, uh, you know, uh, make make sure that the the finances or the eco economics isn't the only driver there. You know, and, and there's some worry about uh, you know food is a worry if 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 bioplastics are coming from corn and from uh, you know, sugar cane, you know, is, is that eating into the world's food supply? Now, you know, that's a, that's a, it's a genuine concern. I think since then we've realized that the percentage is really, really tiny. Um, that's actually eating into what potentially could be food. And now, as Anne Marie said, now you're starting to add cellulose, uh, non-food cellulose, food waste or, uh, or non-food, which is wood chips or food waste as, mm -hmm. you know, second, you know, post, uh, post-use food, essentially. Right. I mean, imagine like, uh, uh, brewers giving up their, uh, you know, 
spent barley or something sure. like that. So, so, so that's not as much of a concern, but it was just one of many that kind of pumped the brakes on what we thought in 2002 or something like that would be the silver bullet. Uh, and yeah, eating up R and D budget very slowly over the course of time is what's happened instead of it being some big, you know, immediate threshold so, moment. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we, so I guess we use this last, these last, you know, decade or whatever to, well, we didn't, we didn't have to spend the R and D, unfortunately. Um, but now that they've kind of ironed this all out and learned all this, are there some examples now that we have out there in the marketplace that are finding ways to apply this? Absolutely. And one of the uh, biggest suppliers of bioplastics that I'm aware of where we've really seen a lot of applications, both in rigid and in flexible is Frasco. Okay. And uh, they do a drop in bioplastic. They do a drop in polyethylene. And um, we have several examples of what they're doing. Originally, they were supplying part of the feedstock for uh, Coca-Cola's plant bottle. Uh, they also worked with a company in the UK uh, to make a reusable bottle. So it was for tourists there who would get a water bottle and then um, just litter. So yeah. there's a lot of litter from tourists. And now you can get the bottle filled and then reuse it. It's a very durable, uh, recyclable and reusable package. Uh, so delicious almond milk is used in their packaging. Uh, there's a toothpaste tube from Ireland that's using uh, the Brascom drop in bioplastic. So yes, we definitely have applications. Now, you say that that coca-cola was using brass are they not still I, I i remember and i remember you just obviously saying 30 seconds ago but i also remember reading this that they were using them and and now it seems like you're are you implying that they're not anymore well what's really exciting is just recently they were able to come up with or or crack the code on uh engineering a completely uh, bioplastic bottle, plant-based bottle. Okay. So formerly they were using 30% bioplastic and I don't know, it's been maybe 12 years that they've been developing this lot of R and D, uh, and they switched. And I, I don't know exactly why they made the switch or, um, you know, they were looking for suppliers, they were investing in different companies, but now they're using 30% hardwood from forestry and sawmill side streams. And then 70% is now from corn and sugarcane, but it is not brassicums. It's a different technology that they're using. Um, and then at the same time, Suntory Beverages also just announced that they have completed a 100% uh, plant-based bottle. Now, in their case, uh, they're using 30% material from molasses, which is very interesting. And they were doing that before. And then 70% is from non-food feedstock. Uh, so they were, they both kind of hit the finish line at the same time, but it's very exciting. Yeah, that is. Now for, for Coca-Cola, for example, are they, I, I will admit, I don't drink a lot of soda. Is this just, I know I've seen it with like the Dasani and stuff like that. Are they able to use this across their product line or is this just something that's something like a water? Like I, I mean, does the different beverages have a different effect in the bottle or can they use their whole product line in these bottles? My understanding is that they could use it across the bottles. Right now they're waiting for a commercial scale up of this technology, but their goal really isn't to replace what they have okay. now. It's to be another option. So they're trying to reach all these sustainability goals. And if I, you know, look at my notes here, they've said that their strategy is to use 70% to 80% recycled PET uh, and then use um, re advanced recycling and renewable materials for the other 30%. So they're not um, moving to plant-based, but it's an addition to. Okay. Another tool in the toolkit. Basically. Yeah, I was going to say, so it's another way to meet a, a certain number or a certain goal. And I understand that. Okay. So are there, I guess the, what I'm thinking is there, are there other kinds of bioplastics besides these, I guess what we've been calling drop-ins, um, things that, you know, that can go with 
PE or PET being used in the marketplace? Yeah, there's a lot being done with, uh, you know, starches, thermoplastics, or excuse me, uh, yeah, thermoplastic starches. Um, I just covered one, uh, I think it was a year ago now, though, it was with Sealed Air, and the, it was a, a pasta company out of Seattle called Cucina Fresca. Hopefully I'm pronouncing pronouncing that correctly. I feel like I've had that before, yes. Possibly, yeah. I, I mean, they sell it out of uh, like that Pike Place market or whatever, wow. so... Um, but they, the lidding material, it was a thermoplastic tray uh, with pasta inside. And, and I don't remember if it was MAP. It could have been MAP, a modified atmosphere. But uh, it was a matter of the lidding material turning to this uh, thermoplastic starch. Um, that was an interesting, and it wasn't the full amount. It was a percentage of it using it. Uh, but then on the subject of starches, there's also, you know, a lot's being done with potatoes, potato starch. Uh, and there's a few different versions uh, one of them is Wada potato that uses resins. It's a biologic with a, the, the logic with a Q from new plastic, plastic with a Q. Sorry, I had to look at my notes for that. I know, there's some reason. And that's, yeah, 20 to 30 percent of the of the pack itself, the pouch is, is from uh, that TPS or a potato based starch. So and then also um, Alexia potatoes from Land Watson are using a, a potato based starch in the pouch. So the interesting thing there is, is you've got potatoes in <laughs> in the pack yeah, right. and the pouch is made from potatoes in a sense or at least a portion of it so there's a, some some circularity there i was going to say that's yeah that that's that that seems very circular um having potatoes in potatoes so i guess are there to kind of put a button on this discussion with bioplastics are there others out there that we haven't touched on because so far I, like i had no, no idea about the potatoes i didn't know about the wood and the cellulose so i'm learning at least somebody out there is definitely learning along with me. So are there other ones out there that would be noteworthy that we should get out? Well, I, I mentioned that the, one of the early misconceptions is that all bio, bioplastics were, um, you know, biodegradable right. by nature, mm -hmm. and they're not. But as Anne Marie knows, that at least one or two of them are. So I think one of them was. Yes, yeah. there's a really exciting new technology that um, has been in development for quite a few years. And uh, it's called PHA. The resin is called PHA, and I can't tell you. <laughs> I know what it stands for, but I can't say. Polyhydroalkanoate. Yeah. Um, and it's made from a naturally occurring organism, which is one step beyond what we're, we've been seeing. And what's really noteworthy about it is that it is marine biodegradable. Um, one company that's been working with uh, Danimer Scientific, which is one of the biggest companies that I'm aware of that's working on this technology is uh, Frito-Lay. And they just released a compostable package made from uh, this PHA material. Uh, the product is off the eaten path. So um, some people may remember that years ago, uh, PepsiCo was really uh, ahead of its time in creating compostable uh, snack bags. Mm -hmm. But the problem at the time was that it was too loud. Oh, so they yes. fixed that. And uh, so this is a very exciting development. So that, yeah, they did get the sound out of Sun Chips. People were very unhappy that their potato chip bag or their Sun Chip bag, excuse me, was too loud, which in and of itself is hilarious because- Priorities, right? Yeah, priorities and chip bags aren't exactly silent as anyone who's ever been in a movie theater would know and bacardi is also using this technology bacardi. too yeah so it's big between frito-lay and bacardi those are two big brands using yeah. this Danimer scientific fantastic uh, and i i guess to kind of wrap up and again i thank uh Anne marie and, and matt for your time is that one thing that you've said a lot and i don't know that i've really highlighted or we've highlighted enough is marine biodegradable from what i understand by saying that is that that's something that in the end will not harm the ocean, correct? That's my understanding of it. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, and that's the biggest thing with plastics. That's the biggest thing that we're, we are always hearing is that at the end of the day, yes, we, we see it in landfills and stuff like that, but then you see these pictures of these massive, you know, uh, flotillas of plastic, yeah. flotilla, thank you, of, of plastic out in the ocean. So that marine biodegradable is a huge thing that uh, I know came up often and, and it's really exciting so that we won't, hopefully continue to harm the oceans in the future so that it, that would no longer be a drawback. So again, thank you, Anne-Marie. Thank you, Matt, for joining us and go out there and uh, get some bioplastics.